Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all? I hope you all are fine at your places. Since you all know that we are doing chapter number three, social institution. And in this chapter, we were into the second institution, institution of tribe, right? And today we're going to proceed further to understand this particular chapter. But before I start to teach all of you, I want all of you to recapitulate or recall what we did in the last class. It's extremely important to do that because it's going to give you more clarity of the concepts, right? You know, it's always important to recall and recapitulate things because it helps us to under, understand things more properly and eventually we get comprehensive understanding. Comprehensive understanding means full understanding, whole understanding of the concepts, all right? So here I go. I'm going to share the PPT with you, okay? So here I go. Okay. So this is the PPD of chapter number three. I'm sure the slides are visible on your screen. I'm sure the screen that I'm trying to share with you is also visible on your screen as well. Okay. So we have to, we have to do three institutions. I've got a message. Yes. Okay. So the slide is visible on your screen as well. If you're using your smartphone, then I would advise you or recommend you to change the mode of your smartphone from portrait to landscape, because it's going to give you uh, you know, larger viewing of the slides that I'm sharing with you. All right. Okay. So we have to do three institutions. In this particular chapter, institution of caste, institution of tribe, and then institution of family and kinship. Okay. So what we did in the last class. What we did in the last class. We started with the concept of visible and invisible aspect of caste. And look, when we talk about visible and invisible aspect of caste, this aspect or this scenario is related to the present situation. So when I talk about the caste in the present situation, or when I talk about the caste in the present scenario, it is all about visible and invisible aspect of caste. And how are you going to understand this? We're going to understand this in a very simple terms. Look, I always try to go to your level. I always try to make you, you know, understand things very easily. And I always go to your level so that you can get better understanding, right? Because if I'll start with my own level, if I'll start teaching my own level, with my own level, then everything is going to go over your head. And I don't want to do that. I want to go to your level so that you can understand things properly. That's the reason I always try to you know, again and again and time and again, tell you about the concepts again and again. I, that's the reason I repeat the thing so that you can get best understanding of the concepts. Look, when we talk about, I'm, you know, discussing whatever we discussed in the last class, we started with this aspect of visible and invisible aspect of caste. Look, when we talk about visible and invisible aspect of caste, what we look, look, when something works for us, it means that that particular thing is visible. And if something is not working for us, then that particular thing is invisible. Now, caste is visible for a certain section of the society. Now, which is that section of society? The lower caste people. All right. And caste is invisible for a particular section of the society. For, for those people, the caste is not working. And here we are trying to understand the, here we, are, here we are trying to understand the taking of public sector jobs. Look, when someone belongs to a lower caste, he has certain reservations. He has certain reservations in gaining government jobs, in gaining public sector job. Public sector job or government job, they are one of the same thing. So lower caste people have certain privileges have certain advantages of having their caste because they get reservations. So when a particular section of the society 
for instance, lower caste people are getting reservation. It means that caste is visible for them. And on the other hand, for upper caste society, for our upper caste people, the caste is not working for them because they are not getting any kind of reservation. They are not getting any kind of advantage out of their caste. So for them, caste is invisible. It's as simple as you can understand this. All right. And remember one thing. This has happened in the present situation and only because nowadays only people are getting reservation. So that's the reason I'm telling you that invisible and visible as aspect of the caste is something that is related to our present scenario. When we understand the present scenario of the caste, we always try to understand this visible and invisible aspect, right? So for a particular section of society, for lower caste people, caste is working. So for them, it is visible. And for certain section of the society, it is not working. So for them, it is invisible, right? Because uh, for upper caste people, reservation is actually no thing. But for low caste people, reservation is there, all right? So they always get a lot of advantages of having their caste. And caste is working for them. That's the reason it is visible for them, all right? So this is what I was talking about. Okay. So now we're going to talk about what? Now we're going to talk about this slide. Look, this slide makes things very easy for you. This slide and this particular slide. These both slides are going to help you to write answer regarding this particular question. Now look, what has written here? The things that I've made you understand just now, the similar things have been written here. Caste system. Contemporary period. Contemporary period means present period. So upper caste and upper middle caste benefited significantly from the development policies of the post-colonial era. Look, upper caste people were educated. They were not discriminated to enter the schools. So it means that they had got the education and they benefited from the public sector jobs or they benefited from the policies that government came up after came up with after independence. So all the upper caste people got their education and eventually they got the employment as well. But what about lower caste people who were not educated, who were not allowed to enter the school? It was so unfortunate. I'm, I'm, it is so unfortunate as an Indian to say this, that there was a lot of discrimination. You all know that there was a lot of discrimination in the past era. There was a lot of discrimination in the previous era when lower caste people were not allowed to enter the school. They were not allowed to get the education. So what happened when, when government came with the policies, when government came with the public sector jobs or government jobs, then all the upper caste people got the job. But unfortunately, lower caste people couldn't able to get, get it because they were not educated. So in order to compensate it, in order to you know, bring them at the same level. Government came with the reservations. Government came with the certain provisions. Government came with the certain advantages. Government came with the certain advantages that only low caste people have because they were lagging behind in the race. When I'm saying race, that it means competition. They are lagging behind in gaining the employment, in gaining the public sector jobs. So that's the reason nowadays in the present scenario, caste system is visible for lower caste people and invisible for upper caste people. And that's what written. That's what is written here. Okay. And the second line, look at my cursor. Upper caste elite are able to benefit from the subsidized public education. I've already told you that upper caste people got a lot of education and education at that time was very subsidized. Subsidized means cheap education. You can, you can, you know, easily, you, you'll be able to relate what I'm trying to say. Government schools have always cheap fees. They have always a cheap education means people don't have to pay a lot when they have to get education in public uh, schools, public schools. What I mean, what, what do I mean when I'm saying public school? I'm saying government schools. So earlier the education was subsidized means cheap education. And most of the upper caste people got a lot of advantages as they got, got a lot of uh, education out of that. Status got consolidated in the second and third generation and believed that caste had limit to do with the advancement. Look what happened. When a particular sex section, when a particular generation got education, their coming generations, their you know, coming generations, first generation or second generation, they also got a lot of education because their parents were educated. I'm talking about the upper caste people. Their parents were educated and they gave good direction to their children. And what happened after that? Their, uh, coming generation also got a got lot of education and they also got an em employment. 
okay they got government jo uh, government jobs so this is what i'm talking about the upper caste but lower caste people were lagging behind they were falling behind in the race right so to compensate to you know bring them at the same level government came with the reservations okay and look at the third point i'm sure you have understood that status got consolidated when i'm saying status got consolidated then it means that the future generations of the upper caste they also got good education they also got you know employment in the public sector jobs so the generations were cons getting consolidated It means they were going on this on the good way but that was not happening for the lower caste people okay then look at my cursor for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe and obc's caste had become all too visible but now in the present scenario caste has become visible for lower caste people because they are getting advantages and why they are getting advantages why they have got the reservation they have got the reservation because they have no inherited education and social capital look for upper caste people they had got inherited education and social capital their parents were educated their parents had the job so what happened the future generations or the children of upper caste people they got education or they got social capital from their parents so they had inherited education and social capital but for the lower caste people there was no inherited education and social capital inherited means something that we get from our parents something that that we get from the previous generation but this was not happening for the lower caste i'm sure you are understanding what i'm trying to make you understand okay so policies of reservation serve as their lifelines look now the policies of reservations or the reservations that they have got in the public sector jobs or the certain provisions and privileges that they have so now that institution of caste works as a lifeline for them because due to their caste they get jobs due to their uh, certain policies that they are getting due to their low, low caste they are, you know they are you know getting advantages out of their caste so that's the, that's the reason it is written that policies of reservation serve as their lifeline so policies of reservation are lifelines for whom for lower caste people for whom for uh, the people who were lagging behind in the past era okay okay so this is what i wanted to make you understand about this concept of visible and invisible caste okay kindly text me if you have understood this concept of visible and invisible aspect of institution of caste visible for whom and invisible for whom okay kindly text me if you have understood this concept hurry up Hurry up, everyone! Text me if you've understood this aspect of in invisible and invisible caste. Okay, understood. Okay. You know, I always try to repeat things again and again so that you know things get into your mind and you. Uh, can able to retain things for a longer time look this subject is more of a discussion based subjects it is more of a discussion based the more we'll discuss the more we're going to understand the concepts okay okay i don't know why my screen has become blank i have to see this is so annoying you know my laptop is not responding why it is not responding uh, tell me am I, am i audible and visible to everyone i don't know what is happening today okay so am i audible and visible to everyone not visible but audible am i visible now tell me am i visible to all of you okay so i'm i'm okay i'm visible to everyone okay so okay the presentation is visible and you are audible okay why am i not visible okay no problem okay okay so this is what this particular question was talking about visible and invisible aspect and uh, 
Okay, so this is another slide that is right on your screen. And this slide also talks about the same things. Okay, so you can read this slide as well to get the understanding of this concept. This is also very simple. I have kept this slide and this slide, you know, to make you understand this particular concept and uh, you can write, you know, uh, the answer in exams through this these from these two particular slides. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about, okay. So now we're going to talk about tribal community. Since you all are well aware that we were in the second institution, we were in the second institution of this particular chapter, tribal community or institution of tribe. Okay. So they are 8.2% in India. They're also known as Janjatis or Adivasis. You can actually see the definition or meaning of tribe from this particular slide. Okay. So there are three meanings or three definitions of this uh, tribal community that you can easily understand if you will read it. Okay. Okay. Now moving on to the an another slide. Okay. So classification of tribal societies are actually it's very, very important. Uh, tribal societies are of two types permanent and acquired so trade means trade means qualities so tribal societies have permanent rates they have got acquired rates as well we also call uh, uh, acquired rates with original trades all right so you have to keep in mind that original trade and acquired rates are actually the same permanent rates are actually permanent rates that uh, talks about their region that talks about their language that talk about their race race means physical characteristics that how a person looks you know uh, what uh, other you know facial features or what kind of features a particular person has regarding his body that's what race is all about when someone asks you what is race you can easily say that race is a physical characteristics of a person that how his nose looks like how is his eyes looks like how his face looks like how tall he is or how short he is you know these all things un uh, come under race so when we talk about the permanent rates classification is divided into two okay permanent rates and acquired rates permanent rate talks about region uh, region means where they live okay language what language they speak race means their physical characteristics and second one is acquired rates that now what they have acquired what are their original traits? When I when I say acquired trait, it means that their original traits. That what kind of occupation they are doing nowadays. Nowadays, the occupation has changed a little bit. Earlier, they used to be, they used to remain in forest every time or and all the time. But now they are coming out of their forest and you know trying to you know come in the normal system of society. And they are working in the industries. They are working. In, in several places they are working in the mines okay so what is their mode of livelihood what they do to uh, to to earn their livelihood to actually uh, get survival what they do this is what mode of livelihood is all about and then we talk about the second second point it's very important to understand here the second point extent of incorporation into hindu society look there there are there there are certain tribal groups that have been observed into the Hindu society, but there are certain tribes of groups that are not observed or that have not come in the Hindu society. So the groups that have come into the Hindu society or the groups that have uh, observed into the Hindu society, we call that, we call, what we call to that group, we say that they are assimilated into Hindu society. Assimilated means they have been observed into the Hindu society. Okay. And when I say attitude towards Hindu society, then you can easily understand from the word itself that they have attitude, you know, in going into the Hindu society. So we have got two extent. When I talk about the extent of incorporation into Hindu society, Society, then we talk about the two aspect that comes out of extent of incorporation. What is what is assimilation? They have been observed into the Hindu society. And what is attitude towards Hindu society? They are not assimilated. They are not observed into the Hindu society. That's what I'm trying to say. And try to understand this. These all things come under acquired traits. These all things come under original traits. And I'm sure now you have easily uh, got the idea that permanent traits are what. Uh, what kind of you know things we talk about permanent traits and what kind of things we talk under acquired traits that is what uh, original traits are all about it's important to have the clarity in your mind when we talk about the permanent traits 
when we talk about the coordinates we don't have to you know cross uh, the explanations of both the things okay so going to the next slide okay so i'm going to make you understand now a little bit about uh, the racial features look the most important thing here which is uh, you know important for all of you to understand under permanent trade is the race you know you often hear this term race that what is race what is physical characteristics all, all about so it's very important to understand the importance of race look what happens most of the people read about tribal societies most of the people read about the institutions but they are not aware of the race most of the people i mean uh, very less people know exact about the race it's important for us to know know it because we are here to understand all these things so what is race a race is physical feature not try not try to understand one thing here look uh, look at my cursor this is i'm on the third point racial classification racial classification so we have got five types of race in the tribal community next negrito negrito we can also call them negrito australoid mongoloid dravidian and aryan look we'll start with the first race that is race of negrito now the name itself tells you that negroid or negrito is something that is related to negros i'm sure you are aware of this term negro african peoples are often called with this term, with this particular term that is negro okay i'm sure you have seen negroes in certain movies i'm sure you have seen negroes in your television and uh, in certain things okay i've got the indication that this class is going to end in 10 minutes so remember that we'll have another session today but we'll use this ten, this particular this particular session also we'll use 10 minutes also but we'll have another session today because i will i will complete this institution of tribe today with all of you okay okay so when we talk about the race i've already told you that we have got five kinds of race ne negrito australoid mongoloid dravidian and aryan look when i talk about negrito negrito is something that is related to negros you all know that negros are related to the countries of african nations we see negros in the african nation and i'm sure you also know their physical features that they have got uh, uh, they have got you know uh, they have got hair that is like maggie i call that i call it maggie hair and we actually call them uh, woolly hair woolly hair is known as maggie hair you 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 i'm sure you are aware of what kind of hair negroes have so it is basically woolly hair but i call it uh, you know maggie hair it's it is just for the remembrance i i i do you know call them with you know maggie hair so they have kind of um, they have kind of uh, i would say broad and flat nose they have got uh, woolly hair so i'm sure you they have got you know big lips uh, negroes look like that so negroes are uh, nothing but the race that i'm talking about right now is negrito so in india the people who looks like negro or, or who are related to negro they live in the hilly areas of kerala they live in the hilly areas of andaman and nicobar so we got, we see all these kind of race where in hilly areas of uh, kerala and in hilly areas of andaman and nicobar so somewhere uh, in those regions we see this particular kind of race and i'm sure you are now well aware that what are negritos you know they are related to negros especially the negros that are uh, that are there in african nations they look like that basically they are that kind of people negrito or negros are one of the same thing okay then i talk about australoid okay now what are australoid now the name itself suggests that uh, these people are those people who have hometown in australia okay so these people have hometown in australia okay so many people of australian uh, country the people who are actually tribes of australian countries have also come in india so you can relate you know uh, australoid race with the uh, or, or with the tribals of australia okay now the now you will you know you, you will have a question that where do these australoid or the people who are you know who have their hometown in australia as the name itself suggests that they are they, they, they particular dwell they particular they particularly live in the areas of central india like madhya pradesh rajasthan mp okay and um, 
Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, MP, uh, Gujarat. So in the central India, your osteoloid lives. Okay, so I'm sure you've got the idea. And they don't have the, that holy holy hair. They don't have that maggy kind of hair. You know, they have quite uh, quite straight hair as compared to the Negro. Okay, so. Uh, these are those people and look uh, when I talk about the fourth point uh, Gaunts, Bills, Santhals, uh, Mundas, these all are those tribes that come under osteoloid that come under that come under osteoloid okay so that's what I'm talking about because uh, you must be thinking that under under you know what kind of tribes come under osteoloid? So, Bills, Gaunt, Santhals, Mundas, all these tribes come under osteoloid, which live in the central India. Okay, now I'm sure we've got the idea of osteoloid as well. Now, we're going to talk about Mo Mongoloid. Uh, since you can well relate that Negrito are those tribes that come uh, or that are related to Negroes of the African nation, and osteoloid are those tribes that are related to the uh, tribals that live in Australia and Mongoloid. When I talk about Mongoloid tribes, then they, these are those tribes that come from the country Mongolia. Now you will, you you all must be thinking that where is Mongolia? Mongolia is a part of China. So all those tribes that come from the China or are, are are living in the India from very long time, they are all Mongoloid because they come from the Mongolia that is there in China. You know, I'm giving you that kind of information that is going to give you great clarity of this classification of race of tribal. It is very important. It's, don't don't think that it is going to you know not benefit you in the future it is definitely going to benefit you in the future right you should have clarity of the race of tribal communities they are the most important and people often think that they are difficult but i believe that they are not difficult it's all about our approach if we try to understand them we'll definitely going to understand it okay most of the people leave all these things okay so mongoloid i talk about the mongoloid tribes are the tribes that come from the mongolia mongolia is a is a, is a territory is a region in china from where these uh, mongoloid come and they uh, and i'm sure you now you will easily able to relate that from where these Mongolo uh, where these mongoloid live they live in the northern eastern states you know assam uh, nagaland uh, arunachal pradesh sikkim so in those northeastern states they live there and you can easily relate that they have got very different oriental kind of eyes you know very different eyes from us you can also include Ladakhis, the people that live in Ladakh, Leh Ladakh region, they also come under Mongoloid. Now you will easily relate what I'm trying to tell you, okay? So the people who live in Ladakh, Leh region and the people who live in the northeastern region, they all come under Mongoloid because they are coming from where? They are coming from the Mongolia territory that is there in the China. So they are coming from there. So we can now easily relate or we can easily understand that how their racial features are all about, how their physical features are all about. I'm sure you'll be able to relate what I'm trying to tell you. Now, there are only two remaining uh, races that are left now, Dravidian and Aryan. Uh, okay, so try to understand one thing here that Dravidian are those races that live in southern India, that live in Tamil Nadu or that live in Karnataka, that, that uh, this particular tribe is related to, you know, part of Sri Lankan uh, country also. So most of the, uh, you know, Dravidians, they are from the southern India, okay? And uh, when I talk about the southern India, then it means that I'm talking about the Dravidian race. And when I'm, when I'm talking about the Aryan, when I'm talking about the last, uh, I'm talking about the last racial class, uh, classification then remember that Aryans always the Indo-Aryans or simply Aryans you can call them Aryans or Indo-Aryans so Aryans come from the northern part of the India on the other hand Dravidian come from the southern part of India so Aryan from northern part of the India all the tribals that live in the northern part of the India uh, your uh, you know JNK, then Punjab, then Haryana, then UP you know all these regions that are there in the northern part of India uh, Aryan lives there in the northern part of the India, Dravid in the southern part of the India, Mongoloid in the Ladakh region, in the northeastern states, Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Mizoram, Meghalaya, Tripura, you know, all these states, Assam as well. So, Mongoloid live there. And when I talk about Osteoloid, they also live in that particular belt of northern region. No, Austria live in the central India. Austria live in the central India. Negro in the Negro, you know, they are divided into different regions. Most of the Negroid or Negritos live in the hilly areas of Andaman, Nicobar, and your uh, Kerala. So Neg Neg Negrito in hilly areas of Kerala and Andaman, Nicobar, and Austria in the central India. Mongoloid 
in the northern uh, you know northern belt that is ladakh northeastern states and the northern himalayas they live in that particular region dravidian in the southern region and rn in the uh, uh, rn in the northern region i'm sure you've got the idea okay that uh, uh, you know how these uh, racial uh, classifications are understood okay so th these were very important okay now with all these racial uh, classification uh, language are connected because i knew that if i'll make you understand about this racial expression you will definitely understand easily you know the language of uh, the, these tribal communities so look what happens uh, remaining meeting time is 1 minute okay so so i'm stopping this session we'll have another session okay so i'm uh, i'm ending this session okay so uh, i kindly request everyone to join the next session that uh, i'll be you know uh, beginning very soon okay so i'm ending this session okay okay so stop share okay so i i want all of you to you know join the next session okay because we'll end this institution of tribe today Okay.